is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 29th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the Senate Finance Committee's adoption last Friday of a $3,000 PFD for this year. What does it mean? Where's the PFD headed? Second, the Senate Finance Committee's simultaneously proposed move of $12 billion from the Permanent Fund Earnings Reserve to the Permanent Fund Corpus. Why did they do it, and what does it mean? And third, what to look for on spending as the Senate takes up the operating budget on the floor this week. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get into the weekly top three. I think that's what that's what people come to hear, not for you and me to uh, pontificate uh, on these things. Let's talk a little bit about the big the big news, which of course was last week uh, on Friday. The senators went ahead uh, by unanimous decision, decided to fully uh, you know move ahead with a full PFD. I was going to say fully funded, but it's they're not really naming a funding source. They're kind of leaving that up to the conference committee. But they placed in their budget a line for three thousand uh, dollars plus three thousand seventy dollars for the dividend. Uh, which leaves them the only chamber that actually put the dividend in their budget. Uh, what say you? Well, this is th- that step is part of a process. I don't think that that we should take it that now the Senate's on board with a three thousand dollar PFD. I think the the key um, for those listening and those reading about it, the key was Senator von Imhoff's explanation that the purpose of it was to create the room. Uh, in the conference committee to 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 have a discussion between a three thousand dollar PFD and and essentially no PFD, which is what the House's uh, budget contains, um, and it was to create create that opportunity in the uh, um, uh, in the conference committee negotiations that are going to come up. Absent absent doing something, like, if the Senate had gone in with say a sixteen hundred dollar PFD, uh, that may have that that may have capped. Uh, the discussions because the conference committee, unless they're granted free powers, but the conference committee is bounded by uh, the high of what one body proposes and the low of what the other body proposes. It's supposed to land somewhere um, in the middle. And and Senator von Imhoff explained that that the move to three thousand dollars was was to do that. But I think I think there's something deeper that's that's important important here, and that is that there's a huge division. Uh, on the committee right now, it appears that there's a huge division on the committee about what to do the PFD, what to do with the PFD, and 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 the person I've started looking to the most on that is Senator Senator Hoffman. Um, Senator Hoffman in the past has been uh, more supportive of taking the PFD. If you look past back, back in his statements, he's been more supportive of taking the PFD to fund government. He's talked a lot about the need for government services, the need to fund it. Um, and and has not been a strong advocate of the PFD, but in this latest series of discussions, he's become uh, a a very vocal uh, about about the need for the PFD, preserving the PFD, the effect that PFD has on election cycles. Uh, if uh, if if it's up to the legislature, the, his concern about that will continue to haunt the legislature and continue to haunt legislate uh, uh, elections and continue to haunt. Uh, discussions in the uh, uh, at the legislature, if the PFD isn't set in some fashion, and has really become a very strong advocate. <clears throat> excuse me, a very strong advocate of fixing the of fixing the PFD in the sense of 
of, of, of establishing it in some fashion, indeed in the Constitution. That's That's been his argument. Right. And I that's a real, that's a change on the committee. And I think part of this is coming from Sarah Machecki's uh, primary, uh, where <laughs> Ron Gillum made uh, made a very, very, very strong run. If, if, if you want to find a PFD hero out there, it may be Ron Gillum. Right. Um, uh, made a very strong run against Senator Machecki, almost defeated him, got Machecki to turn around uh, on the PFD. Lyman may be, Senator Hoffman may be feeling some of that in his district uh, as well. He has one of the poorest districts in the state. Um, and and you look around that table and you begin to see a fairly, uh, with Senator Machecki's conversion, with Lyman's uh, uh, statements, you got Senator Shower on there, Senator Wilikowski, Senator Olson, who also comes from a very poor district, uh, David Wilson. You look around that table uh, and you begin to see uh, uh, strong PFD advocates. Right. So uh, I think the $3,000 that, that, the, that the Senate Finance Committee came out with also was frankly a fairly strong indication that that that, that committee uh, wants to have a fairly fulsome PFD. Now whether you know ultimately they get to three thousand dollars or not in conference uh, is is going to be a huge question. But I think you look around that table and there's conversion uh, around that table. And the three thousand dollars I think is 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 indicative of conversion is well and what's interesting is again the excoriation we heard yesterday from uh is actually one of lyman hoffman's constituents who just called in from the village and just reamed them all but specifically called out hoffman olson and 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 von imhoff uh and you could just see the kind of the slinking down in the chair and and uh you know wiped any kind of uh, joviality off i mean he kept saying you guys are laughing at us and, I mean, I think you're right. I think that it's not just him learning from Machiki. I think that he's probably hearing from his own constituents who are saying, hey, Jack, that PFD is not a nice to have. First of all, it's our money. Second of all, it's what we live on. Uh, we're not buying big screen TVs. You know, we're buying food uh, in the villages and in the rural communities. And uh, and I think that what you're seeing there is a slice of what the average Alaskan I think is is feeling out there. Well, one of the things that that's really fascinated me is trying to understand. That I've really spent a lot of time on is trying to understand what would motivate the Bush legislative delegation uh, to support PFD cuts. Because if you look at the economics of their districts, their poor districts, uh, uh, fairly well. Uh, affected by by PFDs uh, in terms of putting additional money into those districts, and and one of the what, one of the things that 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 I've heard more than once uh, is 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 the statement along the lines of you know there are top twenty percent people out in those districts too. Right. They work for the native corporations. They work for the for the native health associations. They 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 have an earning power. Um, that is that is the equivalent of the top 20% back in the urban areas, and a lot of these legislators. I mean, the the explanation goes on. A lot of these legislators' friends and donor class and supporters come from that top 20% out in the villages. That's a thin layer out in the villages, out in the bush, but but that top 20% is still out there, and 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 the explanation was early on, or the explanation has been early on. That's who they went to. They went and asked, you know. What, what do we ought to do? What, what should we do about the PFD? Or what's your reaction to the PFD? And the top 20% out in the villages were saying, yeah, you know, take it, support government services, support, you know, support uh, state funding, uh, uh, the community assistance program, support state funding, is particularly among the hospital, uh, the, the healthcare systems out there, support Medicaid, which is, which is a big driver to, you know, their economics out there. Um, support, keep supporting those things, fund it. Uh, and it looks like the path of least resistance is to cut the PFD. What 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 seems to be happening over time, uh, and it's not true across the board because you still have Neil Foster who's talking about um, from Nome who's talking about uh, PFD cuts. But what seems to be happening over time is is the other 80 percent out in the villages are finally getting their voice out there, um, and and finally making clear that hey, this is affecting us, um, and and sort of pushing back. Uh, against the against this thin veneer of top twenty percent 
uh, that have been arguing for PFD cuts on the, out in the villages to maintain uh, state support. And and I and Lyman's just uh, just fascinating. It's fascinating to watch his change uh, <laughs> over the course of the last year. Donnie's always sort of been there. He's been a little quiet right. about it, but he's always been there in terms of the PFD. He's he's even more vocal about it this year, though. He sort of stepped up his game in terms of being vocal about it. And Lyman's change is just is just fascinating. So I, I think there's I think sort of what happened in, in the course of last week is, to be very honest, is Natasha got rolled. I think the committee sort of bucked up and said, we're not going down this direction you want to lead us, which is the PFD is the last in and, and, and right. whatever's left over uh, goes to the PFD. I think the committee as a whole bucked up and said, we're not going that direction. Um, and, and her vote on Friday for this $3,000 and the explanation of we're taking it to conference committee is sort of her uh, rationalization of, of, of why it's okay, why Friday was okay. Now, one thing to focus on is who's on the conference committee, right? Because that's going to, we've now, they've now set that up as being the key right. uh, of how the PFD is going to determine. And it'll be the two co chairs, it'll be Natasha and Bert, uh, and a Democrat, either Donnie or from the Senate, either Donnie or uh, Will Akowski. So you probably have two votes there uh, from the Senate side on cutting the PFD, Bert and Natasha. And then from the House side, it'll be the two co chairs, Neil and, and Tammy. Um, and then someone from the Republican side, and I'm not sure who will go from the Republican side on the House side. And that really, that, that'll set up an, a, an interesting dynamic. It takes four votes to get it out of conference committee. Um, and, and so you'll have the two co-chairs, Burton and Natasha uh, from the Senate. You'll have the two co-chairs, uh, Neil Foster and Tammy Wilson uh, on the House side. Um, and, and, and those four may align uh, to cut the PFD, and so the conference committee may come out with a with a with a PFD cut. Then we, it comes back to the two bodies. So we're we're not we're not finished yet. Brad Keithley's our guest, Alaskans for a sustainable budget. I wonder if because uh, I know Natasha wants to cut it. Uh, I'm not sure about where Bert's at right now since he's the one that proposed it. I mean, I think he wants to look like the hero when it's all said and done. You've got Will Kowski. Uh, so if, if uh, Stedman aligns with Willikowski on this and you get the one Republican and I don't know, maybe Tammy Wilson waffles back a little bit and they come out with maybe a twenty five hundred dollar PFD, they still come out looking like heroes if that's the case. I don't know. But I mean, I'm trying to guess a, a good scenario where this might work out. Do you think Stedman would 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 join with Willikowski in something like that? I either Stedman or, or either Willikowski or, or Olson. Donnie may be the, Donnie's the more senior Democrat, and he may be the one that right. the Democrats pick. But I Bert will try to find Bert's driver will be can we is sort of like Lyman's. Can we can we get to a permanent solution here so we can stop debating this every session, and so we can give some some permanence to to how we're going to do this going forward so the permanent fund corporation can rely on what the draw is going to be um uh, things like that i he will he will try to he will try to use this as an opportunity to get some sort of permanent uh solution to to the issue and if it costs if if the price of that is 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 dollars on the pfd dollars to get today's pfd done in order to get a solution he'll do that either way if it's if it's pay more dollars to get to a permanent solution, he'll do that. Pay less dollars to get to a permanent solution, he'll do that. But Bert's goal is going to be to try to find some way to get to a permanent solution. One of the things that I thought was interesting, you mentioned that you know Natasha got rolled, and I kept thinking that like they, you know, I, I kept I, I was watching this whole thing go on, and I kept thinking, you know, so did they? You know, they promise her, okay, we'll get your hearing on 103, we'll do this, we'll look at a more permanent solution, just go ahead and vote for this. She said she was grudgingly voting for it to come out of committee uh, anyway, but I feel like maybe she got, uh, maybe she did get rolled in that, and in the fact that it looked like Stedman, I don't know if 103 is going to come back to the table right now, because again, they are so divided, and the public testimony that came in was just so blistering. I don't know. It may just, I mean, he just tabled it and, and it's like, it's, you know, but does it just go in a drawer or does it come back? Well, you will find out in today's hearing. I mean, 103 is supposed to be back up in today's hearing and, and we'll find out on today's hearing. Now, we're going to, we're going to, we'll, in the second segment, uh, we're going to get in deeper into what part of what's motivating Natasha. Uh, th- 
the uh, the the transfer from the ERA, the amount that they transferred, the Senate voted to transfer from the ERA to the permanent fund corpus plays a big role in in what's going on here. To some degree, if, if you if you look at what she if you look at what her statements were, and you look at the amount of the transfer from the ERA to the to the permanent fund, she may be telling herself that. Uh, in order, she'll 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 agree to three thousand dollars this year, uh, in order a full PFD this year, in order to get that transfer done. And if you make that transfer, if you make that twelve billion dollar transfer from the ERA to the permanent fund dividend uh, to the permanent fund corpus, you can't do it again. You can't have a full PFD again next year. You set up a situation in which the amount that's left in the earnings reserve is barely enough, a little bit over, but barely enough to fund uh, the 5% draw. And you set up absolute competition between the permanent fund dividend and funding government. So part of what she may be doing here. Which is what is, she wants, right? Which is what she's it, looking for, right? Yeah, is, is, running, is running a trade saying, okay, I'll let you guys roll me this year. Uh, I'll let you guys let go this year. You give me this twelve billion dollar transfer, and 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 guess what? We got no choice but to confront this confront this this uh, this this battle between uh, government funding and the PFD uh, next year. And maybe maybe that's okay with Lyman. Um, uh, he he pushed back to some degree on the twelve on the on the transfer, but maybe it's okay with Lyman because then he can he can say, look. Uh, we don't have the money. We now have to make the choice, and it's between government funding the PFD. We don't have any other options, and maybe he's 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 accepting that trade. Maybe that's what's going on. But but you have to look at these two issues together. What, and again, we can discuss this in the second segment. But you have to look at these two issues together to really get a, gr a grip on how this is all playing out. Well, <clears throat> this is, a, I mean, it becomes a dangerous game when you're looking at it in the long term, and I'm, I'm a little frustrated about it. Now, for listeners out there, just a quick reminder that the constitutional budget uh, discussion is going on today from 3 to 5 p.m., so hopefully you got your emails in or you're scheduled or signed up to testify and everything else. We need to get the uh, we need to get these constitutional amendments in again uh, with the caveats that Brad and I have talked about in the past uh, with, uh, you know, with with the various changes uh, for for the spending cap and, and for the PFD. But, yeah, I mean, this is definitely, you know, this is the hot potato that they don't want to have to face every election cycle because they saw what happened with Michiki and they realize how disastrous. I mean, maybe the PFD is still the political third rail of politics after all. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I can't give Ron Gillum enough credit uh, on this. Machiki's conversion has been a uh, uh, that run uh, and 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 the effect it had on Machiki is huge, but the knock on effect it appears to be having. Uh, on other legislators as they look at the potential of it of that, those sorts of challenges happening to them uh, seems to be uh, significant. I mean, I, who would ever have thought Lyman would 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 have cons would have the concerns that he's expressing, given what he said in the past legislatures? But something's something's affecting affecting him, right? And uh, and I think Machiki's close call is is a big part of that. Um, we look at this number. I mean, when I heard first heard the 3000, I mean, I had a lot of people come up to me this weekend while I was in Fairbanks rejoicing. And and I was like, whoa, 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 hold your horses. That's just the top end. Uh, the bottom end is the leftovers. The bottom end is actually zero because they haven't really put a number on it, even though Neil Foster, you know, opined that it might be the twelve hundred dollars that's left over. Uh, but it's somewhere between zero and three thousand or maybe twelve hundred and three thousand. Uh, you have a guesstimate of where you think it's going to land. I got about twenty. Oh, it, uh, it it could be it could be less than twelve hundred. I mean, we still haven't seen a capital budget, right? And and the capital budget, the way they've set it up, the capital budget comes out of the PFD also. If you want to do a leftover, what's left over approach, right? Um, so I I I know I I'm not I'm not ready to do a guesstimate <laughs> of where we're okay. going to land. Continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, working on the weekly top three. We just finished out number one. We're moving on to number two, which again connects back to number one. 
And that is the discussions on moving $12 billion from the earnings reserve account to the corpus, which on its face, you know, looks like it's it's a good idea protecting that money. But there are, there are uh, according to Brad uh, and others, myself included, are ulterior motives to this. And uh, Brad's going to get into that with us. Brad? Well, the second, the second thing that happened last Friday, uh, a less noticed thing, although although it was, I mean, it was it was well reported, but was a, the the second vote that the Senate Finance Committee took was to was to transfer twelve billion dollars the, the the earnings reserve account, which is a portion of the permanent fund that that the legislature has control over. Um, the Senate voted to transfer twelve billion of the 19 roughly 19 billion that's currently in the earnings reserve account uh to the uh to the permanent fund corpus and once it's in the corpus it can't be touched by the legislature anymore it's 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 protected by the constitutional provision that says the corpus can't be sent the, the principal can't be spent uh except by vote of the people so uh they they voted to move 12 billion now that seems that seems like that leaves you seven billion left over seven plus or minus uh, left over it doesn't because they're taking four billion or so this year uh, under the SB 23 draw, the five percent draw that they set up last year. Plus, if they do pay the full th- a full three thousand dollar PFD or anything above the sort of a thousand dollars or twelve hundred dollars that's left over uh, now uh, under the under the budget they've passed, uh, take from the earnings reserve in order to fund that. You get you don't have much left. By the time you do that, by the time you take that out of the 19 billion, and if you move 12 billion out, you don't have much left uh, in the earnings reserve account uh, once this legislature's once this legislature's finished or once this session is finished, and that's critically important when you look to next year's. Uh, well, it's critically important for a, for a lot of reasons, but one of them is is critically important when you look to next year's PFD. Because there's no longer this surplus. It once they do that, if they do that, there's no longer a surplus sitting in the earnings reserve account. The earnings reserve account, the the permanent fund will produce about another four billion, four and a half billion dollars of earnings next year. But you're going to need that to meet the SB 23 draw. You're going to need that in order to meet the draw to to government that they're that they're looking to to help fund government and to pay to pay some of the PFD. So there, there won't be the, 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 the additional amount, the reserve amount in the earnings reserve account next year uh, in, to, to help fully fund a PFD. Uh, you'll set up a, a big competition, a final competition, sort of, the, sort of the end game competition to borrow from a current movie, uh, the end game competition between how you're going to split the SB23 draw between the permanent fund dividend and, and funding government. Um, and that's frankly part of that. That's Natasha's plan. She was very open about it, saying this $12 billion draw essentially is to tie our hands next year and make sure we can't do this again. Make sure we can't have uh, fully fund government uh, and fully fund uh, the PFD, the statutory PFD. We will be taking money out of our hands, uh, the, the money out of our hands by, by putting it in the per- permanent fund uh corpus will be taking money out of our hands in order to uh in order to do that and that and it's really sort of a giant game of chicken then at that point right right you know what, what what's next you're going to look at so look like so this this maneuver this 12 this 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 deposit to the earning from the earnings reserve account and the and the size of the deposit from the earnings reserve account to the permanent fund corpus is as critical to the future of the pfd as and perhaps even more critical to the future of the PFD, uh, as as anything they do on this year's PFD, any amount they set on this year's PFD, and and as we were discussing during the break, um, that's sort of Natasha. That's 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 the that's the trade off that may be going on in Natasha's head. It's okay. I'll give you three thousand dollars this year. I'll vote for three thousand dollars this year as one sort of final act of glory uh, on the PFD. But I'm taking all the money away from you guys. Uh, next year, I'm proposing to take all the money away from you guys next year. So we can't do this. We 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 absolutely prohibit ourselves from doing it again. At one point, she called it the ultimate spending cap. Right. Uh, so it's I, th- this is this maneuver with the earnings reserve account is as important to the overall issue 
uh, as the amount of this year's PFD. Now, you would support a transfer from the permanent fund uh, at, uh, of some kind, just not this large. Am I correct? I mean, yeah, exactly right. I mean, I we, we do have a lot of surplus in the in the earnings reserve account. The uh, because of because of things like this, because the legislature may draw may draw on it, the earn, the permanent fund corporation can't invest it. Doesn't have as much security in making a long-term investment with it uh, as they would if it was in the permanent fund corpus, and that generally means you 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 you're you're not putting the money in its highest highest earnings generating use. You're not you're not able to invest it for the long term in a way that generates the most money for you. You're investing it in shorter term um, uh, shorter term investments, and so. Moving some of the money to the permanent fund corpus, I think, is good. But this amount, this amount has all sorts of repercussions. One, it ties your hands next year. Two, um, it, because we have drained uh, uh, the, uh, the, the 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 CBR, uh, the Constitutional Budget Reserve, which is really was really intended to be sort of the the, the floating reserve that we used when we had short-term problems. Uh, and then to be filled back up once those short-term problems were over, because we've drained that, the earnings reserve account is really the only emergency fund, reserve fund we have remaining. And if you envision something like, well, what if, what if we have a major problem on taps? What if there's an earthquake uh, that 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 takes out taps? Or what if there's a fire? Or what if there's an explosion? Or what if there's an, a sabotage act that takes out taps? Takes out our money flow from oil. Uh, for for an extended period of time, what do we do then? Right. And and the answer in the past has always been, well, we got the CBR, uh, but now with the CBR drain, that's not the answer. Uh, the answer goes to the earnings reserve. Um, and the other thing is is you're then depending, um, <laughs> it, it, you're depending on that SB twenty three draw, and you're depending upon the 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 permanent fund actually generating that five percent return. Well, we've had years in the past. When the market uh, went into a downturn, which not only did we, during which not only did we not generate any return, we generated a, a negative return. We lost money. Right. Um, and and if we had a couple of those years, I mean, we're we're just leaving ourselves with a very thin margin by putting the full twelve billion dollars in there. The House heard a bill yesterday um, from one of its members to put like five billion dollars or six billion dollars, I think, was the amount. Um, in the in, from the transfer from the earnings reserve to the to the uh, permanent fund corpus, and and that would leave roughly nine billion dollars after you take into account uh, the, what's needed this year, take into account the 19 less the four, uh, and then and then less the six. That would leave roughly nine billion dollars to to be dealing with, um, adding back in the four that you'll generate next year, um, and and that's probably a more reasonable amount. To get it into the permanent. Uh, in into into the corpus where the permanent fund corporation can be more uh, more confident uh, in investing it, but the twelve billion uh, the Senate's proposal is just hugely risky and is absolutely intended, uh, for, at least from Natasha's standpoint, to shut down this debate in future years and to force it into the into the closed system of uh, of dealing with whatever the uh, the SB twenty three draw provides. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. That's number two. We've got about two and a half minutes here for our third one, which is, you know, essentially, what do we look for as the Senate takes up the budget this week? What do we need to be watching on? What do we need to be testifying on specifically? And I think that also ties back into what we were just talking about. Well, the Senate takes up the full the full budget on the floor this this week. So it's not we're no longer in the testimony phase, it's cards and letters and calls uh, to your senators. The Senate budget, I mean, the, the spending plan on the Senate budget was $2 million difference. That's not $2 billion. That's two. That's not $200 million. It's $2 million. It's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent uh, different from the House spending plan. And, and you can tell that the Senate did not uh, do any more in terms of curbing costs uh, in the Senate Finance Committee than the House. You, you don't have to go any farther than the university budget. Uh, I've, we've talked about in the past, I think the univer university budget is the canary in the coal mine. If you can't cut the university budget, you're not going to be able to cut anything uh, in the spending plan. And the and the Senate actually added money to the House in the, in the university budget. The university is now closer to this year's 
uh, budget uh, under the Senate plan than it would be uh, under the House plan. And if that survives on the floor, then basically uh, the Senate has said, we give up, we're not going to be able to cut spending anymore. Uh, cards and letters to senators uh, as they take up the budget this week. For me personally, I'll focus on the, the university budget. You guys have got to cut the university budget. We're 250 percent. Our university budget is 250 percent of the national average. Yep. We got three three universities instead of one. Yep, absolutely. These are the things that we'll be looking for. Hopefully cards and letters and calls to your senator's office will make some of these changes. I know Machiki was going to propose another $5 million, but they're going to address that in conference. $5 million is still nothing with a $1.4 billion deficit, though, so I guess that doesn't matter. Brad, um, you know, this is, and I think you just nailed it, it's so frustrating to watch that these guys are not, you know, with with the control of the Senate, you know, you, understandably the House controlled by the Democratic majority, uh, you know, maybe you would not expect things to go as well. But, I mean, within $2 million of a multi-billion dollar budget uh, just seems like weak sauce, really, when it's all said and done. Oh, it's hugely weak sauce. I mean, Stedman said at one point, uh, when the budget was coming over from the House, oh, we're going to take another cut at this, and we're going to get get the budget down more. I tried to do the fraction, the the percent of a two million dollar reduction, and it's like four one hundred thousandths of a percent. It's like four decimal um, places, right? I mean, it's like way down there, right? Uh, uh, that 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 they've reduced it. I mean, it's 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 silly uh, what they did, and basically what what what. If this is what happens on the floor, basically it's the Senate saying, yep, we can't do it. We can't cut it. We're going to go home and tell the constituents that told us to keep spending up that we did it. We're leaving it to the governor. And and, and you're coming back to, are there 16 when the governor vetoes it, as he should, uh, and particularly the university budget, uh, because that that is the canary in the coal mine. If you can't cut that, you're not cutting anything. Um, when the governor vetoes it, are there 16? And, and what I'll be looking for, if the Senate doesn't cut the university budget, what I'll be looking for on the on the floor is when the, there should be an amendment to reduce it. When that amendment goes up, who's going to vote for the amendment to make those deep cuts? Hopefully it includes Senator Schauer, Senator Hughes, Senator Wilson, Senator Reinbold. Um, and if you get four or five out of the Senate willing to vote on the floor to make that deep cut, uh, then you then you assume, I think you can assume, that they're going to be there for the veto override, and then you've got to add on the House members for the veto override. So it's going to be it's, the, the watch is going to be as much for who's there, can you count, and 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 who are you going to be able to count on for the veto override when it comes? Yeah, no, I'm absolutely. I uh, I think that that's going to be the number crunch, and that's what we're trying to figure out right now on the program. We're trying to do the math as to who is on board in the minority and who's in, on board in the Senate. And I think you just nailed the players on the Senate side uh, that I think are, uh, you know, should be on board uh, to match their constituency or to match the rhetoric that they've had. Uh, Laura Reinbold, Mike Schauer, Shelley Hughes, and Senator David Wilson, uh, who we're trying to get on the show for tomorrow as well. So we would have Machiki and Wilson on the show tomorrow, uh, you know, hopefully. Um, but I, you know, I'm with you. And I think if the 15 and the minority stay strong, the governor's got a real shot at bringing this thing in line. And of course he's got the ultimate wild card when it's all said and done is that as the administration, they can decide, uh, how much to actually spend of the appropriation. Cause that appropriation is an upper limit. Yeah, there's, uh, sort of, I mean, there's a court case out there. Sheffield tried that one. Sheffield tried to impound dollars. And there's a court case out there that says you can't you can't do what's effectively a veto uh, uh, by by reducing spending uh, through impoundment. So there are limits. I mean, there's right. It's not unlimited. Right. Yeah. There's some discretion in the administration, obviously, because you don't want them spending wasted money if, if circumstances change. But you can't just use impoundment as a way of bypassing uh, the veto process. Well, we're going to, you know, may we live in interesting times, I guess, Confucius said. We, I, think, I think we're there. I think we are 100% there. 
Um, and, it, and I think it just, again, what we've been talking about just proves what I've been saying here for the last few weeks, which is, man, we could have a 100% Republican Senate and a 100% Republican House, and I just don't think that we could – I still don't think that we could get to the savings numbers that we need because there are just too many constituencies and special interests and everything else that are vying for all those dollars. Yeah. If the Senate Finance Committee – I mean, if you look at the members, if the Senate Finance Committee may, can't make those cuts – Natasha didn't vote for cuts, uh, and and Bert didn't vote for cuts. If the Senate Finance Committee can't make those cuts, uh, it's unlikely the Senate's going to make them. And that's just, I mean, you, I, I I can't talk about the university budget enough. I mean, we got three universities. We the Constitution says one. If we have redundancy anywhere in the government, it's there. Um, if they can't make cuts in the university budget, they just they can't make cuts. Thank thank God we got. We elected Dunleavy as governor to make those cuts, but it's I, I, the, the legislative bodies have just have just abdicated their role of trying to get government size down to, to to fit the revenues, and 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 now it's going to be a question of whether when the governor makes those cuts, whether there are enough legislators that uh, will vote to uphold the governor to uh, to help get that those costs down. The last ninety seconds or so here, Brad. Your final thoughts. You want to wrap up anything we didn't touch on today? The, tw- the, the the key, I think, out of all this is the $12 billion, is the ERA transfer. If you're going to focus on anything, focus, focus on that ERA transfer. The $12 billion is an effort to take the PFD off the table uh, in future legislatures. It's an effort to essentially force a showdown between government spending and the PFD, and we've seen the forces that keep government spending up. So that $12 billion, that maneuver by, by Natasha is – is, is probably long-term much more significant than what the amount of the PFD is this year. Keep your eye on that ball. Don't let it get put under the cup someplace and you, and you, and you miss it. Keep your eye on that ball. All right, we'll be watching it. What's your favorite number again? What's your, what's your preferred number for that? <laughs> uh, I think $6 billion. I think the House side number is, is probably a good number, half of what the Senate's come up with. And that leaves us the buffer and the slush fund. But, you know, hey, don't don't worry. Natasha said trust her. She knows that oil prices are going to remain stable for a while. She said that. Well, right? so, you and know. she also said trust her. She knows that, that, that the stock market prices are going to stay up. Right, I mean, right. It, if if you want to really have nightmares at night, think about what you're trust you're, you're trusting both oil prices <laughs> staying up and now the stock market staying up. Well, she's got the magic crystal ball apparently, so make it happen. <laughs> Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.